Check, check. I would have settled for just a regular welcome. But uh, All right, so yeah, good morning. It's awesome to worship with you. Uh, if you're new or visiting, I'm Pastor Dustin. I'm one of the overseers. I'm the guy who gets to preach all the time. So I'm excited to preach in our beloved series. So we're preaching through uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. So go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 4. And while you're turning there, I have a quick story that I want to share, but you have to promise to uh, still be uh, excited when I share it again a couple months later in a sermon where it really fits the context. But I just have to share it now. I heard this story last week. Uh, So uh, Ben and Morgan Gorman have been a part of this church for a couple of months, and uh, Morgan's blessed grandmother, Mimi, uh, was recently placed on hospice care, and she started to really have a downward spiral, uh, and you know the family's like preparing for travel to come to a funeral, and she was on some really heavy-duty pain medication and couldn't talk and was kind of incoherent. But Morgan had a dream uh, where she came to church, and uh, she saw Hunter, the guy who was just emceeing, and in the dream, she went to Hunter, told Hunter about Mimi, and Hunter uh, went and prayed for Mimi. Well, then the next day, when she came to actual church in real life, uh, she saw the real life Hunter and went to Hunter and Rayanne and said, uh, I had a dream about you where you prayed for my dear precious Mimi. And so Hunter and Rayanne were like, we'll pray right now. So they prayed for dear Mimi. And uh, I got the approval from the Gormans to share this, but I didn't get approval from uh, Hunter and Rayanne. So now I'm going to tell you the part that you haven't heard. A couple of days later, Morgan gets a phone call and uh, she's interested because she recognizes the number and answers, hey, Morgan, uh, who is this? It's Mimi. So Mimi had an incredible bounce back in only a few days and is now talking and not on the pain meds and the family's canceling travel plans. Come on, praise God. Yes. You hadn't heard that part of the story yet, have you? All right, there you go. So that's awesome. Whenever we hear stories like that, I want to share about them because we want to uh, share in the praise for God doing amazing things. There's actually uh, another story that's sort of in the works right now that I, that I will hopefully get to share uh, soon. Uh, so if you are still praying for something like that, some kind of breakthrough like that, I want to encourage you right now to say yes and amen to the testimony you just heard. <laughs> there you go. To say yes and amen, uh, because we want to do unto others what we would have them do unto us. So as you're praying for God to break through in some amazing way, we want to be preparing for the breakthrough by celebrating other people's breakthrough, because it's all the body being blessed by the Lord. So thank you, God. So let's pray for more of those things to happen and for our sermon. God, We love you. We thank you for that testimony. We thank you for dear Mimi, and we pray that you will uh, empower her uh, to live many more years and bless you uh, in every year that she is alive. Thank you for the testimony, God, and we pray for more of that, that you will pour out your spirit upon us in major breakthrough in every area of our lives. God, yes, uh, send the breath, send your spirit into every corner of our lives. And God, would you send your spirit on this sermon? Lord, you know the things that uh, I've prepared. And uh, God, I believe that you've been speaking all throughout the week. Uh, And Lord, I just turn over this time to you uh, to speak a strong and powerful word of encouragement to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So before we get to 1 John, I want to start with kind of a a bold statement to just get us going in the right direction. And the statement is, the fear of the Lord is good. The fear of the Lord is good. I've been thinking about and praying about and studying the fear of the Lord. I've been marking every time you see fear of the Lord all throughout the scripture. So I'm making the statement, the fear of the Lord is good. And I've been thinking about it a lot Uh, since about seven years ago, I heard a story from a fellow named Robbie Dawkins. He was a pastor in Aurora, uh, Illinois. Uh, He actually was a guest on Remnant Radio and came here and did a well service for Wellspring two years ago. Well, seven years ago, I was listening to a testimony of his where he was talking about pastoring a church in Aurora and the city is just overrun by gangs. And a young woman came to the church at, from one of these gangs and gave her life to Jesus. And it was just a, an amazing testimony. But she told Robbie's wife 
that she was kind of fearing for her life, basically, because her boyfriend, she said, was physically abusive to her, and he was a high-up gang member in this gang, and everybody feared him. He was a dangerous guy, a known killer, and she was afraid that, that she was going to be killed for coming to Christ. And so the story goes uh, that they're outside walking, I guess, maybe away from church, and the, the girlfriend stops and is staring across the street as though she's seeing a ghost. It's the boyfriend across the street. And she wants to go the other way, but Robbie's wife sees the boyfriend and gets filled with this indignation, and she marches across the street, and she says, that woman is a child of God, and you won't lay another finger on her ever. And she turned around and stormed back across the street. And everybody that saw it was like, that lady is dead. That guy is going to kill her for sure. Nobody talks to this known killer like that. And they actually were afraid, including the girlfriend, afraid that the whole church would just be destroyed by this gang. So one day goes by and nothing happens. Another day, another day, nothing happens. Uh, And then Sunday rolls back around. And there's Robbie and his wife at the front of the church. And the girlfriend comes in. And there's a whole bunch of these gang members behind her at the back of the church. And she comes to the front and she says, will you pray for my boyfriend? And Robbie's wife is like, well, of course I will. And the gang members are kind of like slowly filing in, but they don't look like they're there for trouble. They have this other strange look on their face. And then the boyfriend comes in and he looks like he's seen a ghost. And the girlfriend says, ever since you stuck your finger in his face and told him not to touch me again. He's been so terrified. He's been unable to speak. He can't eat. He can't sleep. Is there something you can do for this guy? So the gang members lead this poor guy down to the front to be prayed for, and he falls to his knees. He repents of his sin. He confesses. She prays for him, and this terror lifts. And you can cheer for that. That's a great story. Thank you, Jesus. And that story really stuck with me because Robbie said that when his wife rebuked the guy, the fear of the Lord came on him, and he was just rendered incapable of doing anything except trembling. The fear of the Lord came on him, and I just, I thought about that, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. So I have a couple of verses that we're just going to burn through to build the case that the fear of the Lord is good. Proverbs 9.10 you've probably heard this, says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. It's in the Bible in one way or another five times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So that sounds like the fear of the Lord is good. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. So the guy from the story, I mean, the fear of the Lord was instrumental in him turning away from the snares of death and being forgiven of his sins. Psalm 2.11. This one's so weird. If you know what this means, you can tell me afterward. Don't shout it out. But serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. So interesting. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. I don't think I could explain it, but I feel like I understand it somehow. And then Psalm 19, 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The fear of the Lord is good. And so I want to start there, and you'll see why whenever we start to unpack this passage from 1 John. So we're in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 13, but we haven't really been in Beloved for a couple of weeks. So I'll give you a recap. John is writing a letter to a Christian community that has just gone through a church split, and some false believers have left, and they've started preaching some false things about Jesus. They're saying also that it's okay to live in sin. That's totally fine. And they're being distinctly unloving to this body of Christian believers. And John is writing to set the record straight. And the passage that we're going to read today, he wants his readers to hear three things. And these three things he has said at least three or four times already. Because the, the book of 1 John is talked about as though it's a song. It's poetic. And just like how a song will repeat a chorus over and over, John is repeating some themes over and over in this sort of poetic letter. So he wants his readers to hear, confess the truth about Jesus, 
experience God's love, and love others. And you should be recognizing those themes. We've been saying that over and over and over. So what does fear have to do with this? Well, you'll see that in this passage, fear is right at the center of it. So are we ready to start? I think we're ready. Longest intro of my tenure as pastor. All right, verse 13. John says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So you'll see John say this a lot, by this we know. And in in this case, it means uh, this next thing that I'm about to say, that's how we know that we abide in him and he abides in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So that sentence should sound a little bit wonky. Does it sound a little wonky, sound a little weird? You know why? Because it's missing a direct object. I knew it. We've got the indirect object right there. I promise I've only got 15 seconds to spend on this. Us in the sentence is the indirect object. We're given something, but it doesn't say what we're given. It says he has given us what of his spirit. So grammatically, it's kind of wonky, but poetically, uh, we can understand it like this. There's the Holy Spirit somewhere. And God is giving us of the Holy Spirit. He's giving us portions of the Holy Spirit. And it reminds me of uh, the story of the fish and the loaves. Jesus has the bread and he portions out the bread. But the more he breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks, he never loses any of the bread. He's giving of the bread and everyone's eating until they're full and satisfied. And then there's leftovers, so they're overflowing. And it's similar to this. As he gives of the Spirit, he portions and portions and portions. He never runs out of the Spirit. We are filled until we're satisfied and overflowing. And we see all throughout John uh, that the Spirit does a few things. The Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts. So we receive the love of God through this giving of the Spirit We overflow with love to others, so we're able to love others because of the overflow of the Spirit. And this is the really important part for this passage. The Spirit testifies the truth of who Jesus is. We've seen it several times throughout John, and in the very next verse, we're going to see John testify of the truth. So he says, we know we are in God and God is in us because he's given us of the Spirit. Then he testifies the truth. Verse 14, And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. So there we see who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of the world. And then he tells us what to do with this truth. He just testifies the truth, and he tells us what we're supposed to do. Are we good? I feel like we're really getting into the weeds on this. We haven't even really gotten started yet, but just stay with me. So verse 15, he says, Whoever confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So he testifies of the truth, and then he says, whoever confesses the truth about Jesus, God abides in him, and he abides in God. Now, in John's day, uh, remember, there were these false believers who were out there testifying of wrong things, and John's already said, these guys are testifying this anti-Christian stuff because they're speaking by an anti-Christ spirit. We testify what's true because we are filled with the spirit of truth. So confess the truth and you're filled with God. And they would have easily gotten this point by now for sure because this is like the fourth or fifth time John's said this. But there is a takeaway that we actually need to pause and focus on because here we are 2,000 years later. We, are, we think differently than these guys did when John was first talking. So here's this takeaway that I want us to gather from this. It's that believing is different than confessing. So if you're the note-taking type, yeah, we've got it. Believing is different than confessing. Believing is internal. You can believe something, and if it's just in your head, no one ever sees it, but confession is external. So we have this bad habit in our modern Western world of thinking that all real things happen internally and that anything external is just optional. And you'll hear Christians say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. And they're expecting you to agree with them that, yes, my Christianity is all internal, no external manifestation needed. But confession is different than believing. 
Confession takes what's inside and manifests it outside. So when I'm counseling with people, I'll often have them repeat some just basic true things about Jesus. For example, I'll have people say, Jesus, you are perfect. You are king. You lived a perfect life. You died an unjust death. You rose from the dead. You're alive right now at the right hand of the Father. You're worthy of praise. Just things that are true about Jesus. They already believe it, but when they confess it, they feel something happening. People will feel weight lifting off of them. They'll feel the very real tension from stressors in their life start to minimize. Why? Just because they're confessing something that's already inside them. They're just letting it out. They're manifesting it externally. And sometimes really crazy stuff happens. We had a young woman come visit a small group of mine, and I suspected that she was really suffering from some fear. Well, she said, I'm really suffering from fear. So I was keen perception on my part. (laughs) And I just had her say out loud, Jesus, you are God. Fear, you are not my God. And when she said those true things, she started to manifest a demon. She started to scream at the top of her lungs. And the kids are like in the other room, you know, and it's screaming on the couch. It turned into a full-blown deliverance. It was awesome. But why? She was saying stuff that was, that was already true, but when she started to say it out loud, when she got her physical body involved with what she believed, the demon that was lurking around knew that its time was up, and so it freaked out. Because our words are powerful. Our tongues were built by God and given, and given power by God. Our confession is powerful. So we should confess true things about Jesus. So, in fact, that's one of the points. I don't know what point we're on. Maybe one, maybe two. You should confess true things about Jesus out loud as part of your prayer life. Because our confession is powerful. But I don't, I want to make sure you don't hear me saying the same thing that the New Age people will say. They say something really similar. They say that you can actually create reality by confessing what you want to be true. And this is not what I'm saying. I'm saying... You believe it. It's true whether you say it or not. So you confess it to manifest the true thing that already exists into your life. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if you were to visit a staff prayer meeting, you'll hear us praying and just telling God a whole bunch of stuff he already knows about himself. If you want like a prayer 101, that's a great way to learn how to get some longevity in prayer. Just tell God a whole bunch of facts about himself. It's actually praise. Try it. You start rolling and the ball gets rolling and next thing you know, you got this snowball of praise going on and you haven't even asked him for anything yet. Asking God for things is not the whole of prayer. A great amount of it is the worship part where you just tell God things about himself. Think about all the stuff that's in the Bible. You could pray forever just telling them all the stuff that's true from the Bible. So you should confess true things about Jesus out loud as part of your prayer life. Can we say amen to move on? Okay, great. Um, So he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And then John closes this thought in the first half of verse 16. He says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. So How do we come to know and believe? By all of the stuff he just said. Because he has given us of his spirit and because we confess that Jesus is the son of God. We confess the truth about Jesus. This is how we know and believe. The spirit testifies within us as we testify the truth. And then the second half of verse 16, he actually starts a new thought. John is quite taken by love. So as soon as he mentions love, then he starts preaching about love. He says, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So there's that chorus again, abiding in God and God and God abiding in us. And so if you take verse 15 and verse 16 and you put them together, they're both about abiding in God. You see, if you confess the truth in verse 15, if you abide in love in verse 16, 
you abide in God, and God abides in you. So John is giving us a, a litmus test for how to know if the Spirit is in us. It's are we abiding in love? Are we confessing the truth? And when we do those things, John says that love is perfected in us. And he says this right in the next verse, verse 17. He says, by this, by what? By everything he just said. By this is love perfected with us. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. So we're really going to get into the weeds starting right now, if we haven't already been. He says, by this, everything we just said, confessing the truth about Jesus, having been given the Spirit, abiding in love, by this, love is perfected with us. Why? So that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. What that means is when we stand before God on the day of judgment, we don't have to be afraid that we're going to be condemned or sent away. We have confidence. And he tells us why. Because, and this is the crazy part, as he, as Jesus is, so also are we in this world. This one has to be unpacked. What does he mean? As Jesus is, so also are we in this world. Well, how is Jesus right now? He's pure, holy, pleasing to God, accepted by God, in the presence of God. And John's saying that's how we are right now. We're pure, we're holy, we're accepted by God, we're in the presence of God because of his sacrifice, because of what Jesus has done. If we're in him, then we have all of those things that he's saying about Jesus. Now the devil may be telling you, you're not enough. You're not good enough. You're not doing it right. God's not interested in you. God's not happy with you. The devil may be saying that stuff, but the Spirit is saying, Jesus was already enough. And if you're in him, you're in all of the blessing that Jesus has gained from being perfect. As he is, so are you, not later, in this world. That, I'm glad somebody amen to that. That's big time stuff. So, we're going to try to take that first point about confession and this point uh, that we just now made and bring them together. So we can say with confidence, Jesus is holy. Can everybody say Jesus is holy? Jesus is holy. Can everybody say Jesus is, righteous? Jesus is righteous? Can everybody say Jesus is pleasing to God? Jesus is pleasing to God. Okay, that was the easy part. Can you say, in Jesus, I am holy? Jesus, I am holy. Do we have it up here? In Jesus, I am righteous. In Jesus, I am, righteous. In Jesus, I am pleasing to God. In Jesus, I am pleasing to God. Now, as I was putting this together, I was talking to Stacy, and I, I said, does that, does that kind of feel like a feel-good Christian message? And she was like, ah, a little bit. <laughs> and I'm sorry, that's truth. If you're in Jesus, all that stuff's true. I'm sorry it made you feel good, okay? <laughs> That's just how it works. That's how good God is. Write that down. Practice that. Say that until it doesn't trip whatever it was tripping in your heart where it was difficult to say, if it was. I know that it can be difficult to say stuff like that. We're used to saying Jesus is good, Jesus is holy, but we're sort of also conditioned to say, but I am a worm, but if you connect the dots in Scripture, you can say, in Christ, I am holy. In Christ, I'm righteous. In Christ, I am pleasing to God. Amen. Now we're ready for the tricky verse, the part that I've been trying to set us up for the whole time. Verse 18. John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, we already said that the fear of the Lord is good. So does this make fear of God the enemy? I think the way to unpack this is to first ask, how does perfect love cast out fear? John's already told us that if we have been given of the Spirit and we're confessing truth and we're abiding in love, then love is perfected in us. 
and perfect love casts out fear. But where does that perfect love start? That perfect love starts with one singular act of perfect love. And if you've been around church for a little while, you probably know where we're going. John 15, 13 actually tells us what this perfect love, this act of perfect love is. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Who does that sound like? The Sunday school answer is the right answer. Jesus. He's describing what he is about to do for his friends, lay down his life. Then 1 John 3.16 says it again, by this we know love. This is how love is defined to us. This is how we know love, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. Then 1 John 4.9 says it again, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So the genesis of this perfect love is Christ's sacrifice for us. He laid down his life. There's no greater love than that. So Jesus' sacrifice is the perfect love. His sacrifice, his perfect love removes the guilt that we have. It removes the wrath of God. It removes the fear of punishment. Perfect love casts out fear. And I thought long and hard about boiling this down into one statement, but I think that I can confidently say this statement. Fear of the Lord is good. His perfect love is greater. Fear of the Lord is good. His perfect love is greater. That does not make fear of the Lord an enemy. It doesn't make fear of the Lord bad. I think it actually strangely lines up really amazingly with the original covenant, the old covenant, and the new covenant. The old covenant was... Obey my law, and I will bless you. Disobey my law, and I will curse you. And so people obeyed out of fear of the curse. And then Jesus came, and he didn't make the old covenant or the law the enemy. He completed, he perfected the old covenant, and he started a new covenant with his sacrifice that the Bible says is a superior covenant. The new covenant is focused and centered on his sacrifice, his perfect love. So the fear of the Lord is not bad. The fear of the Lord is good, just like the old covenant is good, but the new covenant is better. His perfect love is better. But here are two problems that the church falls into when it comes to this perfect love statement. That some, it's almost like there's two pitfalls on either side of the road. Some don't really embrace this perfect love thing, and they, they remain in the fear of God, even with Jesus' perfect sacrifice, people who tend on this side of the road, and that may be some of you in here, tend to live like God is mad at you. And it's really hard to be affectionate with God if you think he's mad at you. It's really hard to come to him like a child if you think he's mad at you. People who struggle with this side of the road will say things like, God loves everyone, but he tolerates me. And then the devil will race to that statement and say, yes, amen, brother. That's a holy statement. The devil is invested in that statement. People who tend on this side of the road will say, I believe in Jesus. Therefore, God has to forgive me, but he doesn't like me and he doesn't want me around. People who tend on this side of the road feel like they have to work for God's approval. I love that we sing the uh, there's no striving in your love. People on this side of the road are striving for the love because they, they're not embracing the perfect love of Christ. And this is really common to hear when someone's struggling on that side of the road. God is disappointed in me. So if this is you, there is breakthrough for you. We see it all the time here. Uh, my life is based around seeing people receive that perfect love of Christ and be set free to be like a child before God and race to his arms. So there is breakthrough for you, but don't try to keep figuring it out on your own. Reach out to a leader, grab me after church, uh, grab an elder or some, come up here and receive prayer uh, or fill out the connect card and say, I need to embrace the perfect love of Christ. Put it in the thing and we will reach out to you. I love to see this breakthrough in people's lives. So that's one side of the road. The other side of the road is 
kind of the extreme opposite of that. And this side of the road is basically saying, God is so good, there was never really anything to fear to begin with. And you don't really hear people say that verbatim, but this is kind of how it ends up working. Because of the perfect love of Christ, the wall of hostility is gone. We can come uh, confidently before the throne of God and we can have encounters with him. And so we enter into a loving, intimate encounter with God where he clearly sees us and knows us and we're feeling just so loved uh, and known by God. And then we come away from that encounter and some are tempted to say, wow, God was so good. God is so good. Maybe there was nothing to fear in the first place. And they start to question the fear of God. And they're like, yeah, maybe he's just too good to fear. And then they start eventually to despise the fear of God. And then they start to despise the idea of a God that someone would fear. And then you start hearing them say something like, my God would never do this thing that someone would be afraid of. And it's usually something that God clearly does in the scripture. And they're saying, my God would never do that. And then uh, they end up rejecting verses about the fear of God. They end up rejecting verses where we see the anger of God because it's not compatible with the God that, that they feel like they had encountered in the encounter. And so the God we see in Scripture becomes unacceptable because they're interpreting God through the lens of this encounter instead of interpreting the encounter through the lens of Scripture. So the encounter is not the enemy. The encounter was good. The encounter was real. And you say, well, well why? If, if it's messing up their theology, why would God do it? Well, if they're pressing into God, he's going to come near. But it's up to us to leave the encounter and stay tethered to the word. So here's how it looks, I believe, to, to interpret the encounter through the lens of Scripture. So I've had some really just awesome encounters with God. And I remember maybe the first really just knock down, drag out, awesome encounter with God where I felt like I saw the vastness of God and I felt so infinitely small. How could he possibly have anything to do with me? Look at him and all of his glory. But then he noticed me and he, I felt like his giant finger just comes and touches my heart. He pours the, his love into me. It's more than I could even bear. And it, it went on like any time I would pray for a couple of days, that would happen. It was awesome. But then to interpret that encounter through scripture, that makes me say, whoa, the God of that encounter is the same God that when Uzzah reached out his hand and touched the ark in an unholy way, his anger broke out against him and killed him. And I go, wait a minute. Like when I, in my Bible, where that happens, I have written in the margins, God is intense. <laughs> but that's the same God of this really intimate, loving encounter. How? And then I go, oh my gosh, the sacrifice of Jesus made it possible for me to be touched by the infinitely huge finger of God and not be destroyed. And so the encounter is still awesome. And now I'm appreciating the sacrifice of Jesus even more. Yes. To say that, that God was so awesome in this encounter that there must not have been anything to fear is to diminish what Jesus did. He made that incredibly intense God that we see in Scripture our Father so that we can be in his presence. His perfect love casts out the fear. Now, here's the challenging part. I can think of four churches that are tending toward that end of the road, that pitfall. And these churches typically, regularly, have amazing, intimate encounters with God corporately that I am jealous of. And that is challenging, isn't it? They're tending toward this error of thinking that, that God was, is too good to ever fear, 
And just like I said, diminishing the work of Jesus on the cross. So why are they having intimate encounters that I am jealous of? It's because God said if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. And they're coming together, unified, into the the corporate gathering like children with reckless abandon before God. And he is pleased with that, and he pours his spirit out on them. But it's up to them to leave that encounter and stay tethered to the word of God. That's, That's enough about them. I'm not bringing that group up to really talk about them. I'm bringing that up to talk about us at Wellspring we really strive to have a high level of theological accuracy. And so the question that we need to solemnly ask before the Lord is, are we trading theological accuracy for affection with God? I'm not accusing you of doing that. I'm not saying that we are. I'm saying we should ask. Are we being satisfied with an intellectual experience so that we're not hungry for an intimate experience. And we just need to ask that question. Now, you don't have to have one or the other. It's a, just a tragedy that we sort of feel like you do. You have to trade theology for the experience or experience for the theology. I believe that theology ought to stir deeper affection for God. And I believe affection for God ought to lead us to better theology. If you have really great theology that satisfies you perfectly, that you don't need the affection of God, you have bad theology, and you probably have an idol. Theology ought to stir deeper affection for God. God, we want that. And affection for God ought to lead us to better theology. It has to be both. It has to be both. Now, admittedly, this would be a fantastic place to end the sermon. But, <laughs> but every time John brings up the love of God, he always attaches it to our love for each other. Just go all throughout 1 John. It's always like that. And in this passage, it's the exact same way. He's just talked about the perfect love of God, and then he has to talk about our love for one another. So I know we don't have a whole lot of time left in the sermon, but we've got to cover the last part, our love for one another. He says in verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Our love for each other is predicated on his love for us. And he says in verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment We have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Amen. This is challenging for us. It's really common in our modern Western Christianity to feel like my relationship with God is all about me and God. And the Bible does not allow us to believe that. John attaches his relationship with God to his love for others. And he says, your love for God has to be manifested with love for others or it's a sham, it's a lie. We want to be a church that is loving, but it has to be God pouring his love into us to go into each other. But we have to be a church that loves each other because otherwise this love for God that we say that we have is false. So to have this outpouring of love into us that overflows into others, we need the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. We talk about the ministry of the Spirit week in and week out. The Spirit in us enables us to testify the truth of Jesus. So we need to confess the truth by the Spirit of God in us. The Spirit in us enables us to experience the love of the Father. So we call on the Spirit to pour the love of the Father into our hearts, and then the Holy Spirit in us empowers us to overflow with love for one another. So this is the kind of church that we want to be, a a well-rounded church, a full church that is loving God and loving each other. There's no other way to do it. A church that is that is furiously hungry to experience God in intimate, affectionate ways by furiously devouring the scripture and applying it and not picking and choosing the things that are easy, but but drinking it all in and saying, of the things that we don't understand, God, help my unbelief. 
but saying, God, I have to have your presence. So uh, worship team, can you guys go ahead and come up?